Hello and welcome to the first topic of the Stay Standing program online. This is the balance topic. We recommend that the material on balance and the home exercises be presented together in the first session, ideally by an exercise professional. However, non-exercise professionals could use the accompanying presentation run sheet to assist them. We also recommend that each program participant be tested for their risk of falling at the first and the last program sessions using the falls risk indicator test that we teach. This slide introduces you to the presentations from the Stay Standing program. The topics listed in the left column of the table are supported by scientific research as reducing the risk of falling. The topics listed to the right are our program extension topics that our group participants have asked to learn more about. We think they're also related to falls risk and are important for independent ageing. So this presentation considers what balance is, how we lose our balance and how to preserve our balance so we can stay independent. I just want to reinforce that maintaining our independence is the ultimate goal of all of these presentations. Thinking about balance, a commonly used definition amongst health professionals is that balance is the ability to keep the body's centre of mass over its base of support while we're at rest or while we're moving. Your base of support includes the part of your body which are supported by something else, and that might be your feet on the ground, it might be your walking aid if you use one, or even the table that you happen to be leaning on. Balance is useful for independence and moving safely. If we can't move safely, we might fall and injure ourselves, and this can reduce our independence. We may not be able to do the things we'd like to do. Moving safely to avoid injury helps us to keep doing the things that we enjoy in life. At this point of the presentation, let's think about the activities that we most enjoy. What would you love to do? What would you miss if you couldn't do it anymore? Or maybe what are you missing now that you used to be able to do? If your balance was a bit better, could you return to that enjoyable activity? Exercise that improves balance is the best way to reduce your risk of falling. But doing exercise of itself is not usually a goal. In the Stay Standing program, we emphasise that exercise practice is a means to an end. We think of exercise as a way to stay independent enough to keep doing what we actually love to do. And when we teach you the home exercise program, we'll remind you to keep the activities you love in the front of your mind while you practice, rather than thinking, oh, I have to do three repetitions of ten of these exercises three times a day or whatever. Being able to continue with your favourite activity is a powerful incentive to practising the home exercises. So what are the things that you love to do? Do you like visiting your friends and relatives? Perhaps you enjoy going to the shopping mall or to the movies or to the club or fishing, bushwalking, dining in restaurants, sitting on the park bench under your favourite tree. You might have plans to travel or maybe you just want to be able to walk safely to your own letterbox again. Whatever your driving reason is for staying independent, focus on that while you do your exercises. And this will help you overcome the obstacles of boredom and distraction. Later in this presentation, we're going to cover the principles of effective balance training. And once you understand these, you will be empowered to recognise whether a particular kind of exercise or activity will actually help you improve your balance. First, let's think about how our sense of balance works. Our sensory organs send information about our environment and our body's position to our control centre, the brain. The information travels from sensory endings in different parts of our body to the brain via the nervous system. The brain's continually receiving and integrating vast amounts of sensory information. To maintain balance, the brain processes sensory input and sends messages outwards to the muscles to change length and tension. And this all has to happen very quickly. Sometimes things can go wrong, resulting in a fall. The World Health Organization definition of a fall is an event which results in a person coming to rest inadvertently on the ground or a lower level. One of the key words in this definition is inadvertently, meaning that the fall was an unplanned event. We discuss why falls are a problem for older adults and the wider community in a separate presentation. For now, we'll consider the three key organs of balance. The visual system, including the eyes, the vestibular system, including the inner ear, and the proprioceptive system, especially the lower limb joint and muscle receptors. 
The image on slide 8 represents a cross section showing some basic eye structures with the front of the eye to the left and the back of the eye to the right. In simple terms, light waves from the sun bounce off objects and through the opening at the front of the eyeball. Light passes through various structures and mediums to reach the light sensitive cells at the back of the eyeball. These cells are called photoreceptors and they consist of the rods for detecting shades of grey and the cones for detecting colour. When light waves reach the rods and cones, they trigger a chemical reaction which converts into nerve impulses. And those impulses travel to the brain's visual processing centre via the optic nerve. The brain's visual centre is located at the back of the head in the occipital region, and this explains why an injury to the back of the head can result in visual problems even if the eyeballs aren't damaged. The Stay Standing program has an entire presentation dedicated to vision and falls prevention, but for now let's note that vision is very important for maintaining balance. Our eyes receive information about our body's position at rest and during movement. Visual cues in our environment are often subconscious and might include the vertical lines of trees and buildings. And that reminds me of a story which I want to tell you about when I was a kid. I remember going on a ride in an amusement park called Luna Park in Sydney. And this was kind of a big room decorated like a normal room inside a house. We all sat in a row on a long bench. And during the ride, it seemed that the bench was tipping upside down. But it was all actually an optical illusion. The bench never really moved. It was the walls rolling up or down around the bench. And our eyes just tricked us into feeling like we were tipping upside down. The visual system works closely with the vestibular and auditory or hearing systems. And often people with visual and hearing disturbance also have poor balance. The image on slide 9 represents a cross section of the right ear. And we'll follow the path in through the outer ear via the ear canal, past the eardrum and the three smallest bones in the body, which are called the hammer, the anvil and the stirrup through to the inner ear. Being inside the skull bones, messages from the inner ear reach the brain quickly and are very important for maintaining balance. The structures of the inner ear are called the semicircular canals, the utricle and saccule, and together they're shaped a bit like a snail or a squid. The three semicircular canals are positioned perfectly to capture every angle of movement. They are filled with fluid and lined with small, fine hairs, and when the fluid moves, the hairs bend and send positional information to the brain. The utricle and saccule detect movement with respect to gravity and motion, and just want to emphasize gravity is a key ingredient in this sensory system. There are usually two sets of these organs working at once, one on each side of our head, when they work properly, the information they send to the brain is symmetrical. Issues with balance happen when the brain receives mixed or incorrect messages, and this can lead to the sensation of vertigo or dizziness, although dizziness can be caused by other issues not related to the inner ear as well. Anyway, next time you're in an elevator, just try this. Try standing still and notice whether you can detect movement. Even when your head does not move, you will still have the sensation of moving up or down. And this is due to gravity acting on the utricle in the inner ear. Maybe some of you have been sailing or on a cruise and had the sensation that you're still on the moving boat even when you're back on dry land. These sensations are due to the interaction of the visual and the vestibular systems. In fact, seasickness or motion sickness is due to the brain receiving conflicting messages about motion and your body's position in space. Amusement park rides take advantage of these systems. The sensory receptors in the skin, muscles and joints send information to the brain about body position and movement too. The image on slide 10 shows a person practicing on a wobble board. The proprioceptors from the lower limb inform the brain and the brain controls changes in muscle length and tension to enable the person to stay standing. The image on slide 11 is of areolar connective tissue magnified 100 times. This kind of connective tissue is found in many parts of the body. For example, it holds the skin in place and binds it to the muscles underneath. All of our body tissues are composed of proteins in various concentrations. The slowing of protein production leads to normal age-related changes. 
while other changes are due to disease processes. And we explore this topic in more detail in our Aging and Falls online training module. Collagen makes our body tissues strong and elastin makes our tissues flexible. As we age, our protein and hormone levels change. Production of collagen and elastin reduces by about 2-3% every year after the age of 25. Wrinkles and sagging are the more obvious changes, however many organs are also affected. We also experience other hormonal changes as we age, and normal age-related changes include increasing visual deficits, such as the reduced ability to focus on small print or close objects, which is known as presbyopia, reduced ability to distinguish between fine differences in shades of grey, or the contrast sensitivity of our eye, an increased time for the eyes to adapt between light and dark, and the reduced ability to change focus between near and far objects, which is termed accommodation. Normal age-related hormonal changes and reduced protein production in our tissues can affect our eyesight, our reaction time, and our muscle strength. And these can all combine to inc increase the risk of falling. So over the course of the Stay Standing program, we'll consider how we can manage these risks. Now we're getting the bigger picture of how falls can occur with the interaction of a range of risk factors. Age-related risk factors are also increased in the presence of chronic disease. And I'll just remind you here of the top five contributors to the development of most chronic diseases. And that includes the use of tobacco, high body mass, excessive use of alcohol, physical inactivity and high blood pressure. We have a fascinating graph on slide 15 showing the results of a study where people of different ages were tested to see how long they could balance on one leg with their eyes open and their eyes shut. The eyes open is the top line and the eyes shut is the bottom line. So this graph indicates a few important things. Firstly, all age groups did better with their eyes open and this indicates how important vision is for balance. Secondly, younger people did better than older people with their eyes open and their eyes closed, and this supports the fact that there are age-related changes which affect balance. And thirdly, and possibly the most interesting, just notice the rate of declining performance across the different age groups. From age 60 to 69, we start to see a big decline in balance, both with our eyes open and our eyes closed. The next graph was published in a report for the Australian Institute for Health and Welfare. And this report found that the rate of hospital admissions for people aged 65 and over having a fall increased by about 3% per year between 2002 and 2017. And while that figure is concerning, the reason we put this graph onto the presentation is because it shows that by far the most hospital admissions for falls are in people aged 65 years and over. And this happens every year. Other sources tell us that most people stay in hospital around 15 and a half days after a fall. Each stay costs around $20,000 for an older adult living in the community and about $140,000 for a person living in a residential aged care facility. We're going to look at the economic and social impact of falling along with some more statistics in our Aging and Falls online training module. But for now, in summary, we know that one in every three people aged 65 and over are falling in Australia and in similarly developed countries at least once every year. And that figure increases to one in every two people falling by the age of about 75. Life expectancy is increasing and the baby boomer generation has reached the age of retirement. They've got a special term, silver tsunami. That term is used to describe the potentially overwhelming economic and social effects of the global increase in the ageing population. But earlier I said that scientific research shows that falls risk factors can be managed and reduced. Best practice programs like Stay Standing can help us learn to manage and reduce our falls risk. There are countless ways to analyse falls risk factors but to keep it simple, we'll look at those which are part of us, or intrinsic, and those which are outside of us, which we'll call extrinsic. An intrinsic risk factor is a risk factor we carry around inside us, like how old we are, our gender, whether we live alone or with other people, if we've had any other falls, our level of cognition, our state of mind or mood, and whether we have any other medical conditions and the number 
or kind of medications we take to manage those conditions. We discuss the kinds of medications and health conditions associated with falling in our Managing Medication Learning module. Think of extrinsic risk factors as being outside of our own bodies. These could include whether we use a walking aid, the surfaces we walk on, obstacles in our environment, the level of lighting, our glasses, hearing aids if we use them or have them, and footwear. Extrinsic risk factors are usually easier to change than intrinsic risk factors. We can improve some intrinsic risk factors, like doing balance and strength exercise or having regular checks of our vision and medications. This presentation will focus now on effective balance training, but we also have presentations on staying safe and comfortable on your feet, managing medication, walking aids, bone health, continence, chronic pain and sleep management. Now for the health professionals and care workers listening to this presentation, I just wanted to run over the best practice recommendations for falls prevention. Not all kinds of exercise improve balance and scientific research does not support walking programs, hydrotherapy or strength training by themselves to improve balance for reducing falls risk. The research-based exercise recommendations to prevent falls in older adults include that exercise must provide a moderate or high challenge to balance, exercise must be of sufficient dosage to have an effect, it must be ongoing, it should be targeted at the general community as well as those at high risk of falling, and falls prevention exercise can be undertaken in a group or a home-based individual setting. Walking training should be included in addition to balance training, but high-risk individuals should not be prescribed a brisk walking program. Strength training may be included in addition to balance training, and exercise providers should make referrals for other risk factors that need to be addressed. So those are the best practice recommendations. There are currently two population level programs that demonstrate improved balance, and they are Tai Chi and the Otago Exercise Program, Balance and Strength Exercises. The Stay Standing Program has a home exercise program for participants, including six of the selected Otago Exercise Program, Balance and Lower Limb Strength Exercises. And the Stay Standing Program also has an opportunity for a Tai Chi presentation near the end of the program. Getting back to the principles of effective balance training. If we had to summarise the principles of effective balance training, and this is a key message for this presentation, we could say that you must practice in standing against gravity, reduce your base of support, practice controlled movements over your base of support, and practice for at least two hours a week for at least six months. So let's just go over those again. The first principle was to practice in standing against gravity. That's not sitting down and it's not in water, although there are appropriate times for sitting down or being in water, such as the hydrotherapy pool. But the evidence for improving balance is limited in those situations. What we need if we want to train our balance is to practice in standing with the influence of gravity on our systems of balance. Reduce your base of support. And that just means bring your feet closer together or, or stand on one leg or reduce your hand support. But having said that, always include your safety precautions. When you practice your balance exercises, make sure you're standing next to something that will take the weight of your body if you happen to overbalance or if you need to just reach out for support. Practice controlled movements over your base of support. And you might think of the Tai Chi moves where the person's reaching and leaning in a controlled way over their, their base of support, their feet. Practice for at least two hours per week for six months or more. Some people say two to three hours per week is necessary. Anyway, that equates to about 20 minutes a day. So if you can fit in 20 minutes a day of balance training, that is the best practice recommendation for improving your balance. Everyday life can get in the way of establishing a balance exercise routine. Think about what obstacles could come your way in your daily life and how you might be able to overcome them. One way to do this is to think about why staying independent is personally meaningful for you. What do you love to do that requires you to move safely? 
When the exercises get boring, and they will, think about the more meaningful activity that these exercises will help you keep doing. In terms of strategies to overcome obstacles to exercise, link your exercise practice with your existing routine. For example, meal times, tea breaks, or television time. Each Stay Standing program participant receives a home exercise manual and logbook to record your exercises in. Thinking about preparing for exercise, make sure you're medically able to do the exercises. While you're exercising, if you do experience dizziness, chest pain, or excessive shortness of breath, just stop exercising and contact your doctor. If you know you have a medical condition, it is best to discuss with your doctor before participating. Always have a solid, stable support within arm's reach, such as your kitchen bench or a solid table. Once you're doing the exercises, always start with the basic level. Only progress to the upgrades or include weights when you can do the basic version easily. Ensure exercise is conducted in a well-ventilated area and have some water nearby in case you get thirsty. Above all, remind yourself what you love to do as an independent adult. Thinking about comfort and safety, these exercises should be safe to do at home when you follow the safety precautions we've just mentioned. If you're not used to exercising, you may experience short-term muscle soreness, which should reduce within a couple of days. If this happens, try gently moving your limbs and massaging your muscles towards the heart. Muscle pain is different to joint pain. If you do experience increased joint pain, stop the exercise and discuss it with your facilitator. Do not use ankle weights if you already have pain in your back, your hip or your knee. So now let's review our key messages from this presentation. We found that the following sensory systems are important for balance. The visual system, which are our eyes. The vestibular system, including our inner ear. And our proprioceptive system, which includes the skin, the muscles and joints, especially of the lower limb. We also learned that age-related and other changes can increase our risk of falling, but that risks can be managed. We also learnt that not all exercise is effective for balance training and we considered the principles and practice of effective balance training so we can keep doing what we most enjoy. Thank you for your attention in this presentation and I look forward to joining you again for the next presentation.